Hello, everyone, and welcome to Soil Electrical Conductivity, Managing Salts for Sustained High Yields. Today's presentation will be about 30 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A with our presenter, Dr. Galen Campbell, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. First, we want this to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit any and all questions in the questions pane. We'll be keeping track of these for the Q&A session toward the end. Second, if you want us to go back or repeat something you missed, no worries, we're recording the webinar and we'll send around a link to the recording via email within the next three to five business days. All right, let's get started. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Galen Campbell, who will discuss the fundamentals of measuring soil electrical conductivity to manage salt and soil. Dr. Campbell has been a research scientist and engineer at METER for over 20 years, following nearly 30 years on faculty at Washington State University. His first experience with environmental measurement came in the lab of Sterling Taylor at Utah State University, making water potential measurements to understand plant water status. Dr. Campbell is one of the world's foremost authorities on physical measurements in the soil plant atmosphere continuum. His book written with Dr. John Norman on environmental biophysics provides a critical foundation for anyone interested in understanding the physics of the natural world. He has written three books, over 100 referee journal articles and book chapters, and has several patents. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Campbell to get us started. Hey, thank you. And thank you for being with us today. I visited the city of Inchuan in the north of China in the early 1980s. Uh, Inchuan is on the Yellow River where irrigation or irrigated agriculture has been practiced for thousands of years. This was just before Christmas, and I saw a lot of white there, but it wasn't snow. Everything was covered with salt. Now, unfortunately, that's the fate of too many places where irrigated agriculture has been practiced for a number of years. Uh, the earliest irrigation systems, those that were established in the Fertile Crescent at the dawn of civilization, eventually succumbed to poor drainage and accumulated accumulations of salt. Uh, many later ones have seen a similar fate. As we'll see, salt is in the water that we apply for irrigation. And if the salt and the water are not managed properly, the salt will build up in the soil, decreasing yields, and finally ruining the land for agricultural production. The costs of this mismanagement uh, are enormous. A recent calculation that I saw just for the Central Valley in California was a billion dollars. So it's worth it to know what's going on and to manage for sustainable production. But how do we do that? Dr. Richard Sturzacher, a CSIRO soil physicist in Australia, published a book in 1910 or in 2010 called out of the scientist's garden. He calls it a story of water and food. In it, he talks about a Goldilocks principle that relates to his own career path in water management, uh, water management research. He started out focusing on instruments for monitoring, monitoring uh, root zone water content in order to manage irrigation. Now, I uh, explained the use of these kinds of instruments to you in a seminar that I gave a couple of months ago here. The correct measurement of water content and especially of soil water potential are important for proper day-to-day -day irrigation management, but they don't give much insight into sustainability. They are too fast. He then studied salt in groundwater and in rivers. And again, this is important information for an irrigation project, but it's too slow for management decisions. By the time you see those response, responses, uh, you've already lost the battle. Dr. Sturzacher finally started focusing on salts in and just below the root zone. And this was just right. Uh, to provide the information needed for proper sustainable management of irrigation. So today we want to talk about 
how to make those measurements. The problem, as I said, is that uh, salts are in the irrigation water. When we irrigate, uh, those salts enter the soil with the water. Uh, the water leaves the soil mostly by evapotranspiration. The water can evaporate, but the salts can't, and so they stay in the soil. Now, there are other important sources of salts in the soil. We apply chemical fertilizers to crops. The crops take up some, hopefully most, of those, but some usually remains. Groundwater also contains salt. If the water table is sufficiently close to the surface, evaporation will bring the salts to the surface. Over-irrigation brings the water table to the surface uh, more rapidly and therefore uh, is one of the main causes of salinization in irrigation projects. Now, this was the source of the salt that I saw in Yinchuan. Uh, drainage systems can drop the water table and mitigate this problem, but it's better and cheaper uh, when possible to just avoid that by proper irrigation in the first place. Now, why do we care if salts build up in the soil? In the last lecture, we talked about water potential and the fact that gradients in water potential uh, are the driving force for water movement from the soil through the plant to the atmosphere. The water potential can be expressed as the sum of several components. The most important for plants are the osmotic and the matrix components. We talk about the matrix component and its measurement, talked about it, the matrix component and its measurement in the last seminar. Depends on how wet the soil is and, and the makeup of the soil, its texture. The osmotic component depends on uh, how much salt there is in the soil. As the soil dries, uh, water availability to the plant decreases both because the matrix potential decreases, but also because the salts are becoming more concentrated and uh, the water more difficult to remove from the soil. Crops vary in their sensitivity to osmotic stress. Uh, here's a list of crops organized according to their uh, sensitivity to that kind of stress. Uh, to those of you who are experienced in irrigated agriculture, a list like this isn't any surprise. You know where the salty places are in the field and you know what will grow and what won't grow there. Um, we have records of crop production in those early irrigated fields of, of Mesopotamia. They were kept on clay tablets. Early records show that a lot of wheat was produced in those areas. And you notice that wheat is in the moderately tolerant uh, uh, column in our table. But that later on, um, only barley would grow. And you can see that that's in the tolerant uh, column. Now, to quantify how salty the soil is, we measure its electrical conductivity. The old units for electrical conductivity were millimoles per centimeter. Uh, uh, conductivity is reciprocal resistance. Mo is ohm spelled backwards. And so it was used as the unit of conductance. Uh, that has now been replaced by the unit Siemens to keep the numbers the same size as they were in that old system, we use units of deciSiemens per meter. And uh, data on crop production at each of the for each of the four groups of crops uh, that we saw in the last slide are organized on this graph. Um, we can see for a particular crop and a particular uh, electrical conductivity, we can see uh, which 
group would would uh, thrive or survive there and what the yield reduction might be for a particular value. It might be obvious, but it's really important to understand that the more salt you have in the water, the higher its electrical conductivity. In this graph, I show that relationship for sodium chloride. Now, of course, there are other salts in the soil and the relation between those salts and electrical conductivity will be a little bit different than this. Uh, but since sodium chloride is the most important one, this gives a pretty good uh, idea uh, for those. The other thing that I wanted to show here is that uh, the relationship between electrical conductivity and osmotic potential. Uh, you see the electrical conductivity on the left axis and osmotic potential on the right and a direct correspondence between the two. Uh, they're about minus 40 uh, kilopascals per decisiemen per meter. Now you might remember that in our uh, last seminar, maximum potato production was achieved by keeping the soil wetter than minus 100 kilopascals. 100 kilopascals is around two and a half decisiemens per meter, as you can see on the graph here. And so um, the, uh, if we uh, have concentrations, osmotic potentials that are more negative than that, we could expect at least insensitive plants to see a reduction in, in uh, yield or in production. And that gives us a good kind of benchmark to, to uh, understand the, the effects of, on production. Now I've been talking about electrical conductivity without being very specific about what I mean by that term. And I want to get a lot more specific now. We'll refer to three kinds of electrical conductivity, and it matters a lot which is which. And so it's important that you understand which is which. The first is the bulk electrical conductivity, EC, EC sub B. Uh, if I stick one of our Terrace 12 sensors into the soil and measure the electrical conductivity of the soil, that measurement will be the bulk EC of the soil. Now that doesn't mean much by itself, but it along with other data can be converted into much more useful numbers. If I were to somehow squeeze the water out of the soil and measure the electrical conductivity of the water that I get out, uh, we would call that the poor water or soil solution EC, the EC sub W. That's the electrical conductivity or the uh, equivalent osmotic potential that the plant sees. And it uh, determines how stressed the plant is. Uh, the final of the three electrical conductivities is called the saturation extract EC, EC sub E. You get that by saturating a soil sample with distilled water squeezing some of the water out of the soil and measuring the electrical conductivity of the water. When someone talks about the EC of soil, that number is the one that they mean. Uh, the EC values we associated with the sensitive, moderately sensitive, moderately tolerant, and tolerant lists of crops we saw in the previous slide. Uh, the EC that we mean is the uh, saturation extract TC. That value has been used to classify soils for many years and uh, may seem completely arbitrary way to get a number, but it turns out to be brilliant. The exact value we need for Sturzhocker's Goldilocks measurement. Now I hope with this simple dimensional analysis to convince you that the saturation extract uh, EC is a fundamental property of soil. 
if we start with the kilograms of salt per cubic meter of water in the soil, uh, so that's the pore water. And if we multiply that by the water content of the soil in cubic meters of water per cubic meter of soil, uh, that comes out to have uh, units of kilograms of salt per cubic meter of soil. And so that's the salt content of the soil, a fundamental property of the soil. And now the electrical conductivity of the pore water is a measure of the amount of salt in the water. And if we multiply that by the volumetric water content of the soil, we'll get an electrical conductivity that's proportional to the um, amount of salt in the soil. Now the, the ECW, the pore water EC, becomes saturation extract EC when the soil is saturated. And since uh, the electrical conductivity, the pore water conductivity, uh, and the water content vary reciprocally, the value on the right-hand side of this equation will be constant for a soil as long as the salt content doesn't change. Um, you can get the same number by taking that same number by taking a soil sample, saturating it with distilled water, and squeezing out some of that water and measuring its electrical conductivity. That's the way that has been done for years and years. But that's an awful lot of work, especially if you have to cover th several thousand acres. Uh, it'd be a lot better and a lot easier if you could just put a sensor in the soil and that sensor would tell you what that uh, saturation extract EC is. Now to help fix some of these ideas in your mind, I want to go through a couple of thought experiments with you. Let's consider what happens to the salt in the soil during two processes that uh, occur all the time in the soil. One is the redistribution of water uh, following initial infiltration, and the other is evapotranspiration. In redistribution, water and salt move to deeper depths in the soil. So the water content of that initially wetted zone gradually decreases, and the salt content also decreases. With evapotranspiration, the water content decreases, but the salt stays in the soil, so the water, this, uh, water content changes, but the salt content stays constant. Let's, for this thought experiment, assume that the soil has 50% pore space and the saturation extract TC is one decisiemen per meter. Now here we're showing the electrical conductivity versus water content uh, for uh, in three values, the, the, uh, the pore water electrical conductivity, EC sub W, the bulk electrical conductivity is the blue line, that's ECB, and in the circle is the saturation extract EC. We can see as the water moves deeper into the soil, both the salt and water are lost from uh, that initially wetted level of the soil. And so the pore water EC stays constant, uh, but, the, but both water content and salt content decrease. Uh, if we took a soil sample, uh, added uh, distilled water to it and determined the saturation extract TC, it would be lower than the initial one that we see here because the salt content is decreasing in that layer. Uh, since both the water and the salt are decreasing, the bulk electrical conductivity decreases pretty rapidly uh, to a very low value as the water content decreases. Now the picture is quite different for evapotranspiration. Here the water content decreases while the salt stays constant. So the pore water EC increases dramatically from that saturation value. 
uh, bulk EC decreases less rapidly than it did in the previous example because um, only the water is being lost and the salt is, is staying there and being concentrated. If we were to stop at any point along the black line, we could add distilled water until the soil saturated again, and we would end up back at that saturation extract circle. The black line is therefore a function that we know and can always follow to get to the saturation extract EC from the poor water EC. So if we can somehow uh, find a way to go from bulk to poor water EC, then we can go uh, to the saturation extract EC. Uh, I want to use uh, these pictures to help you understand why the bulk EC is always less than or equal to the poor water EC. On the left hand, in the left hand picture, we have just water with salt in it. Nothing in that impedes the flow of electricity when we make the measurement, and so the bulk electrical conductivity is equal to the um, electrical conductivity. Uh, to the poor water EC. Now, if we add soil particles, the cross section for flow of electricity is decreased by the presence of the soil particles, and the length of the path that the electricity has to flow is increased. Uh, in a typical saturated soil, these effects reduce the bulk electrical conductivity to about a third the electrical conductivity of the poor water. Now, if the soil desaturates uh, in the panel on the right, um, then uh, air spaces appear in the in the soil, and so the cross section is even further reduced, and the distance that the electricity has to travel is increased even further, and so that ratio is even bigger. I show it as a value of ten here. But uh, of course, the drier the soil gets, the bigger that gets. So this graph shows the multiplier, uh, an example of multipliers that you can use uh, to multiply the bulk EC to get the poor water EC as a function of the water content of the soil. And uh, for wet soil, that number, as I said, is uh, something around three. You can see that here. And then as the soil dries out, the, the value increases lap rapidly. And the uncertainty also increases rapidly. So besides the, uh, if you want to go from bulk EC to poor water EC, you, you can see from this graph that you need to know both the bulk EC and the water content of the soil to do the calculation. The Terrace 12 sensor gives both measurements, and so uh, it's easy to do that calculation here, but you can see um, that you wouldn't want to do the calculation uh, for a very dry soil, or the calculation would become pretty uncertain uh, because of the large value of the multiplier. Uh, field capacity is typically around half of saturation. The saturation here we show is 50%, and so probably below about 25% water, you would not want to trust the, the uh, calculation you'd get from this. I want to say just a few words about leaching fraction. Uh, it's the ratio of the amount of water draining out the bottom of the soil profile to the amount of water that we apply. Uh, if you go through the uh, calculations in some detail, you'll see that that definition is equivalent to the ratio of the electrical conductivity of the irrigation water to the electrical conductivity of the drainage water. Uh, but the electrical conductivity of the drainage water is the EC of the saturation extract because the water drains at saturation. Now, this 
uh, calculation is normally used to compute the amount of water we need to supply in excess of crop requirements to maintain some desired electrical conductivity in the root zone. So if we were supplying irrigation water that was 0.3 decisiemens per meter, we wanted to maintain a root zone a saturation extract EC of three decisiemens per meter, we'd need to apply 10% uh, more water than the crop uses. But we could turn that calculation around and apply it the other way. We could measure the EC of the irrigation and the EC of the saturation extract EC of the soil below the root zone and know how much water uh, we were using to deep, losing to deep drainage. Um, I think that gives you a little bit of insight into why Dr. Sturzhocker said knowing the EC in and below the root zone is that Goldilocks principle. Now to give a feeling for electrical conductivity of irrigation waters, uh, some of them have, um, have this table. Um, it gives, I think, some valuable insights. You could irrigate with Columbia or Sacramento River water for quite a long time without much concern for uh, salt problems. But if you were irrigating from the Pecos, you'd have to be pretty careful and probably grow barley or sugar beets. Now, at this point, you should have a good understanding of the principles involved in managing salt and water in irrigated agriculture. But you, how do you apply those principles? You can't see the salt in the irrigation water, and by the time you can taste it, why it, water wouldn't be much good for irrigation. You won't know the state of salts in the soil until the crops start to fail, and then it's too late. You need a way to measure the salt. And here are some excellent tools to help you do that. The ES2 measures the electrical conductivity of water, and it does it very accurately. The Terrace 12 measures the water con content and bulk electrical conductivity of soil. These are plugged into the ZL6 logger that connects to Zentra Cloud. The data flow to the cloud through a cellular connection and the computations are made in Zentra Cloud to give you pore water EC and the electrical conductivity of the irrigation water. So here's our scenario. The Terrace 12 measures water content in bulk EC, which goes to the ZL6 and Zentra Cloud and is converted to pore water EC. The pore water EC and the water content are used to get saturation extract TC. The value at the bottom of the root zone is Sturzhocker's Goldilocks measurement. We can use it for crop suitability, crop loss calculations, or to estimate drainage losses. For example, let's say that the, the uh, saturation extract value that we got was five decisiemens per meter. Uh, right here. And let's say that we wanted to grow strawberries, which are a sensitive crop. And so we're interested in this line here. So we would go up from the five decisiemens per meter, and we'd see that uh, the relative yield that we would expect for that salty soil for a sensitive crop is something like 60%. Um, about a 40% reduction in yield. Now that information would be useful for us. We would determine whether uh, maybe strawberries isn't the best choice of crop to grow here, or uh, if it is, uh, if it's the one that we wanna do, we'd know what to expect for a yield. We might decide that we need to reduce the electrical conductivity of the soil some by uh, leaching some water through it so that we could get increased production. Um, and then the last point I show on the slide here is uh, that leaching fraction calculation done backwards to emphasize uh, 
the idea that we can uh, use those calculations to determine the fraction of the water that we apply that's uh, going out the bottom of the profile. In the last seminar I gave, I showed some data obtained from experiments that were conducted uh, in a collaboration of meter scientists with faculty at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, and a very progressive farmer in southern Idaho. These data are from that same farm. But here we're computing the saturation extract, electrical conductivity values, under irrigated wheat. And we show three levels here, uh, 15, 45, and 65 centimeters, or six inches, a foot and a half, and a little over two feet. Remember this picture is of the salt content of the soil at the level of measurement. The shallowest level is in blue. A couple of spikes are shown here. Those likely are the result of nutrient additions from fertigation. Uh, the middle depth uh, that's shown in orange shows a couple of those bumps, but a lot smaller. Uh, but in general, uh, the electrical conductivity at this level is decreasing, and that likely is because of plant uptake of nutrients. The lowest level shows a slight increase over time, possibly from downward movement of salts. Uh, the irrigation water had an electrical conductivity of 1.1 decisiemens per meter. Now, if that were the only source of water, the leaching fraction that we would calculate here would be 25%. Uh, but uh, for this farm, probably about half of the water that uh, is used by the crop is, is from precipitation and precipitation has essentially no salt. And so we probably would uh, divide that uh, irrigation electrical conductivity in half, uh, meaning that the deep leaching is, or the deep drainage is uh, maybe between 10 and 15%. Now this record is too short to make any grand predictions about general trends and sustainability. But if we had a record that went over uh, 10 or 20 growing seasons, uh, we'd have plenty, uh, plenty good idea of uh, what our practices were doing to the sustainability and what we needed to do to make adjustments to, to be more sustainable. So I'd conclude with these thoughts. First, uh, the obvious one, that mismanagement of salt in an irrigated agriculture is costly, um, goes without saying, but monitoring the saturation extract TC at the bottom of the root zone is the just right uh, measurement for long-term management in, uh, of irrigated agriculture. And the final point I'd like to make is the meter has the tools to provide the right measurements for modern irrigators to choose the right crops and to manage water sustainably. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. And thank you, everybody, for participating, for joining us today. We'll take, uh, we've got some time for some questions, and we've got several questions that have come in already, and we appreciate you for all of those questions. Um, if you, again, there's still time to uh, enter your questions into the questions pane and we'll see them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, depending on the time constraints that we have, we'll see how many we get to. There are quite a few that are coming in and have come in already. Um, if we do not get to your question, I, I just want to put this out there. If we do not get to your question, we do have them recorded, and one of our, uh, one of our experts here at Meter will be able to get back to you via email to answer your question directly. So, um, first question, Dr. Campbell. Um, this question, they're asking about um, about salinity stress. So their question is, are there also positive effects of salinity stress, like being a trigger for defense mechanisms to biotic stresses? And I think maybe on the other on the other side, or along with that, are and 
are there any uh, crop plants or plants in general that that do better or thrive in in more saline conditions? Uh, yeah, that, certainly that's a really good question. One of the most interesting areas in uh, plant water relations, to me at least, that uh, the uh, crops can be steered uh, by adjusting stress. And in, we talked about this in earlier seminars, but um, in, for example, in uh, wine grapes and in, in fruit crops, uh, by managing stress, you can control vegetative versus reproductive growth. And uh, that's done uh, typically in, uh, with matrix stress in soils, but in, in soilless media, in greenhouse production, why uh, you can't use matrix stress, you have to use osmotic stress. And so all of that steering in, in uh, greenhouse production is doing done by manipulating the osmotic stress. Okay. This next, next question is a, a combination. It looks like we've got about three different questions squished into one. So I'll try to break it down to make it a little bit easier. Um, so in the ET, in the evapotranspiration example, where you're plotting water content versus EC, you show the bulk EC decreasing slightly. Is that because of the trade-off between increasing pore fluid EC during evaporation versus decreasing water content? That's the first right. question. Yeah, okay. the, the, um, as the water content decreases, why that, that uh, if the salt content stayed constant, that would decrease the, the bulk EC pretty rapidly, but since the, the salt concentration is increasing as the water content decreases, it doesn't decrease as rapidly. And so in practice, does this depend on the particular field site and soil such that in some cases you may see a stronger decrease or even an increase in that relationship? Yeah, you, know, you would never see an increase. Um, and it, uh, that relationship does uh, does depend to some extent on the soil, but but not strongly on the soil. Okay. Uh, next question here: What management practices can be implemented to balance the needs that plants have for irrigation water and keeping the saturation EC low enough for sensitive crops? Well, let's. Um, that's where the leaching fraction comes in. That that you, um, depending on the the quality of the irrigation water that you can apply or that you're applying, you have to apply enough water to to leach the salts out the bottom of the soil profile or at least out of the root zone, and then you have to uh, usually provide for drainage so that to get that water away so the water table won't increase. Um, another question here, this one, how might um, somebody who's studying coastal agriculture uh, go about um, studying EC where you have the effects of, of seawater um, and then may, maybe along the same lines where you might have crops that are uh, that are at or near the water table just in in uh, in regular settings as well. Any insights for there? I'd go to Israel to study. <laughs> <laughs> They're by far the the leading place in the world for uh, understanding how to how to deal with high uh, with irrigation with uh, high EC waters. So um, in, in speaking of the that, that Goldilocks zone about trying to find uh, and measure EC right at the at the, the base of the root zone, um, where might people find um, references for uh, for root zones of specific plants? I can't say off the top of my head. There's, uh, I mean, there. I'd start on the internet. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there about that, but I, I can't tell you specifically. And and do you have any insight on any remediation tools that are available to reduce salinity in soils? Well, it, it 
the only way that I know of that it's done is to uh, is through drainage and leaching, and uh, you need good measurements in order to know what you're uh, what's happening and what you're doing with that. All right. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. We also have a number of questions uh, regarding potted plants. Um, we have several experts who are um, who can answer those questions directly. So we probably won't have time to get to any of those questions here. Just wanted to let you know for those of you um, who have asked questions about, about uh, dealing with EC and potted uh, situations. Um, let's see, we'll find one last question here. Um, not only might, uh, well, you stated that depending on the on the plant type, um, some plants are more tolerant, more sensitive to salt. Some do better or do worse in in salty uh, conditions and soils. Um, do we know? Is there any impact on um, on seed quality when it comes to to that? Where the the plants might be able to they they might seem like they are doing okay, but the seeds themselves uh, might do better or worse. Well, uh, you know that's uh, it's a good question, but a complicated one. Um, the depending on when the plant is stressed and uh, how much it's stressed, that that all has a um, big effect on how assimilates are partitioned and um, and eventually how what, what effect that would have not only on the whole plant, but on the seed that's produced. Okay. Well, that's gonna do it for us today. Uh, we're gonna need to wrap up there. Um, we still have a, a ton of questions that we did not get to. So again, I just wanna let you know that, that we do have your questions recorded and somebody from our meter team will be able to get back to you directly via email and answer your questions. Um, we hope you enjoyed this discussion um, as much as we did here. Thank you again for your questions. And please consider answering the short survey that will appear after this webinar is finished, just to le let us know what types of webinars you'd like to see in the future. For more information on what you've seen today, also visit us at metergroup.com. And finally, look for a link to the recording of today's presentation in your email. And stay tuned for future Meter webinars. Stay safe and have a great day.